Welcome. It's so lovely to see so many familiar names and faces and a very big welcome to anybody whom I haven't yet met. I don't feel much like a master or that this is really a class. It's, it's, it's more a conversation I want to have about thoughts and, and things that I feel quite obsessed about, the topic of leadership and its critical impact locally and globally. But this isn't about the economic consequences of, of leadership as much as it's about what would be powerfully beneficial and, and is more and more evidential as I hope we share in, in this uh, session in promoting skillful, intelligently mindful leadership. When initial discussions came up last November about offering this um, session, the context was managing with resilience in a VUCA world. It seems that COVID-19 has tilted us even further into this world of volatility, unpredictability, change, and ambiguity. More than we might ever have imagined we might have to navigate right now. So what's on the menu? I want to look at leadership through the perspective of world, we and me. So the world perspective, we've just done our poll and it's very lovely for me to know that quite a few people are very familiar with world views because that's going to come into what we talk about. And the question for me with world leadership is what is going on? When you think about leaders like Trump and Obama, Bolsonaro, Jacinda Ardern, Viktor Orban, Angela Merkel, all in the same period of time, all in our world right now, with very different kinds of leadership, what accounts for it. And that's where the conversation about worldviews and stages of adult development will come into this. Then the we of leadership, what do we do as coaches and leaders who have a coaching competency? What do we do for on-the-job skills and leading others? And, and that will bring in the concept of horizontal learning and development and vertical learning and development. And then the me of leadership is what can I do to develop myself as the kind of leader that's optimizing the skills that I think we, we need and that worldviews and stages of adult development are kind of um, suggesting to us. And of course, weaving through the neuroscience so far, what is the evidence of the qualities that we're talking about? And I really welcome questions. I know Jacques is going to be on the board for that, looking at anything that comes up. And okay, so let's begin. The question, what invention came first? The wheel, the combustion engine, or the jet? And it's fairly obvious, the wheel, of course. But the question is why? Why did the wheel come before the combustion engine and before the jet engine? The point is that human beings who were capable of inventing the wheel were reaching the limits of what they could do at that time in terms of task complexity. Over time, we get better at doing things at in increasingly more complex levels of accomplishment. The um, orders of hierarchical complexity and their corresponding stages, and it's different from proposals are that we're used to, that, that are kind of um, dominate the field of human development, in that it doesn't involve behaviors. It doesn't describe behaviors. It is focused purely on task. 
and the hierarchies of complexity in the development of task and information. So it, it, it builds on Piaget's stages of child development in the sense that less complex tasks must be completed and practiced before more complex tasks can be acquired. And this accounts for the developmental changes seen in individuals' performance of complex tasks. And each of us can relate to that. We, we have experience of having to master a task and practice it before we can move on to something more complex. So I believe we need to make a very clear distinction between task complexity and evolving stages of consciousness, behaviors, values. Which brings me to this gentleman, this famous person, Claire Graves, a pioneer in supposing these stages of human development between um, the 1950s and the 1980s when he died. He was very cautious in proposing these stages. And in the 1980s, before his death, he made this statement that human nature prepares for a momentous leap. And I think we are on the cusp of this momentous leap for reasons that I hope we can explore during this, this, this talk. He said, Briefly, what I'm proposing is that the psychology of the mature human being is an unfolding, emergent, oscillating, spiraling process marked by progressive subordination of older, lower order behavior systems to newer, higher order systems as an individual's existential problems change. So that, that unfolding, emergent, oscillating, spiraling process of our psychology, of our behaviors, is an important concept. It isn't fixed. Not in the same way that task complexity can be mapped and developed. If we look at a model of stages of development, stages of consciousness development. This is a picture from Steve MacDonald, which kind of is a composite of various people's concepts of stages of human consciousness development. And, and this picture represents particularly Ken Wilbers and Spiral Dynamics. And the two people who wrote Spiral Dynamics were students of Claire Graves. Don Beck and Christopher Kahn. And what this is showing us, and I'm looking at it particularly through the lens of evolution in an individual life, evolution of consciousness from birth until um, death in an individual life. Not everybody reaches every stage of consciousness available to us. And also how we can look at leadership in organizations. So if we look at the first two levels, survival and tribal, one and two, color-coded with Wilbur's model and spiral dynamics, beige and purple, we're not really looking at much leadership in, in those. In beige, all you want to do is survive. That's the level of conscious awareness. In tribal, you're reaching towards self as with an identity inside tribe, inside the group. It could be your community, it could be your church, it could be your rugby team. It is me as part of um, my identity with, as part of these people. So at tribe, really, the values you would say are all for one, one for all. And historically, we know that this was the emergence of magical thinking. And lest we think that this is very far away from us, it's very much with us. If you've ever thrown salt over your shoulder or worried about a black cat crossing your path or the bad luck of losing your wedding ring, 
which I had uh, an experience of recently with my husband who lost his wedding ring while cutting grass. And the panic to find this ring was monumental, like this can't be happening. So the areas of leadership focus and worldviews that we're looking at is from three and above. So what emerges from tribal consciousness is the hero leader, the egocentric red worldview of I can take control. I am the strong man, the world needs to be dominated and I can do that through power. Unless we think that this is just one person's perspective, the, uh, the view of the feudal lord, the hero leader, the dominant egocentric leader, it's actually the worldview is that of people being willing to be led by this kind of dominance. It's a shared set of values at that level. And there are organizations who operate like that. And we can um, get a hint of that in a, a, a just a little further on. What emerges from the single leader, the dominant leader, at a more complex level of leadership is the amber blue level authoritarian. It's also a conserving level. It's the emergence of more than one leader at the top, a council, parliament, board of directors, who preside over a whole range of different positions, hierarchical positions where everyone knows their place. A dominant value is loyalty and the organization promises stability conserving order, with conserving being a key value. And in each of these stages, we must remember that there's light and shadow. So the light of that kind of leadership, which is very familiar in corporates today, is security, lifetime employment, knowing and predicting what my world feels like, what will happen next. The shadow, of course, being overly rule-bound, resistant to change. And then what emerges from that level of leadership, the orange worldview, the entrepreneurial enterprising leader, where innovation is prized, bold initiative, it breaks the mold of hierarchical order, it operates on a reward basis, or profit share, think Uber, Richard Branson. And again, orange has its light and shadow. The shadow being greed, um, profit at all costs, and the light being the reward for new inventions, for exciting innovation. You might imagine at one stage that Bill Gates with Microsoft was in that orange worldview, shared those values. And then we see him emerging into the next level, humanistic, green. And it's interesting to see, if we go back a bit, that each of these levels shows different composites. At beige, it's just one single disc. At tribe, that beige disc is subsumed, absorbed, contained, included in tribal, in purple, and so on. Each level gets more complex, is able to hold more perspective. Nothing goes away. Survival doesn't go away. Sense of tribal doesn't go away. The sense of red energy doesn't go away. It just becomes more complex, more organized at a higher level of operation. At green, at the humanistic level, we're getting a sense of reconnecting with humanity, people, not just profits, seeking consensus, agreements, acknowledging how people feel. There are flatter structures, sharing decision-making based on shared values. 
And the downside of green is often seen as cumbersome decision making, slow ability to get to action because of consensus. By the way, where would you place George Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos in this level, these set of levels? I speculate that he is definitely orange. He embodies orange worldview values while paying lip service to his cognitive understanding of humanistic values, green values. Kind of, you know, notice what people do rather than what they say, how they show up. And I think we so easily understand cognitively different values without really embodying them. They're not really fully lived in every aspect of our lives. Then we get to this exciting piece, the dotted line, the leap. Human nature prepares for a momentous leap, said Claire Graves. What happens above the leap? It's an emergence of and a deep understanding of the difference between a natural hierarchy and a dominator hierarchy. Anything below the dotted line tends to hold onto a dominator hierarchy structure, even at the most humanistic level. And each worldview below the dotted line prefers its own set of values, its own center of gravity, tending to despise or dismiss the level that it has emerged from. You might see this with two siblings, both of whom deeply believed in Father Christmas and the older one discovers, oh, it's just dad putting up the beer and sandwiches. There's no Father Christmas. But the younger brother still believes. So the older brother says, you're so stupid. Even though he believed this yesterday. And we tend to do that. When we move from one set of beliefs to another, we tend to reject that we were ever there at that low level. But what is a natural hierarchy? Think of your own body. Think of what it consists of from atoms to molecules to cells to organs. The more superior organs cannot operate without the healthy functioning of the lowest order of cells, as we're beginning to find out in discoveries about our microbiome and the bacteria in our intestines our growing awareness of their influence and in our well-being throughout our bodies, including our brains, and at every stage of our lives. We can't just say to our body as an organization, I think we can save a lot by just cutting out some of these cells. We wouldn't function well. We need everything, and we need to value the working of everything in an interconnected way. And that is what a natural hierarchy is. And this is the crux of my purpose in wanting to share this discussion with you today, because this is what excites me, is it seems to me that we interfere with the natural hierarchy at our peril, as COVID-19 is so amply demonstrating, and climate change. And the exciting thing is that we have access to knowledge of a natural hierarchy and why it is so important for the survival of this planet and for the survival of the human race. Said that less than 2% of the human race are reckoned to be fully above the dotted line in an embodied sense of really living a true, deeply grasped sense of what a natural hierarchy means, honoring those values. And yet, I think we have evidence at younger and younger ages of a sense of that emergence of people grasping at younger and younger ages what it'll take to lead in this world, to belong to a connected system of values that honors our resources, honors human life across the planet. 
And this is truly exciting. There's a lot of stage development theories are very attached to the age at which certain wisdoms are accessible. And that is true too, but it's very exciting to see a deeper, wider grasp of what it might take to lead in the 21st century. So I think I'd ask Jacques now if there are any questions that have come up, anything of interest to yes. bring in. Dr. Aiken, so uh, we have a question from Paul. Paul say, uh, asks, uh, what causes regression in consciousness evolution? I think trauma, uh, brain damage, extreme terror, perhaps. Um, I know from various accounts of people who have survived um, concentration camps, um, one of them was a scientist, what was his name? He committed suicide, sadly. Um, I'll think of it, Prima Levi, Prima Levi. He said in his experience of surviving the concentration camp that he was in, that he became a beast at a certain level of immersion in that terrible world, that all the sophistication and grace of the humanity that he was living with as a scientist before he was in that camp started to just regress until he was at the most basic level of survival. And then you get somebody like Victor, Fra Victor Frankl who discovered his humanity and his meaning for living in those circumstances. So it's difficult to say what makes different people regress, but at the physiological level, brain damage, a coma, an accident, illness. Anything else, Jack? Yes, Dr. Eken, there's another one from Ilza. Uh, she asks, to what extent does context uh, influence how leaders show up in, uh, in this context? So with context, it means organizational, social, etc. Leadership is situational. I, I really do believe that, that certain, um, certain contexts, certain situations will require a different kind of intervention and a skillful leader can do that. There's a very good book, I think, um, it's uh, Daniel Goldman it, and Boyd Zykes and Annie McKee, I think it's Daniel Goldman as well, Resonant Leadership. Um, and it names five kinds of leadership capacities that a good leader can access, can be able to juggle according to which human values you are met with, which, which is the worldview that you need to understand and connect with. And that is the thing about above the dotted line. Those people who are truly conscious above the dotted line have a deep understanding and connection with the levels below the dotted line. Where the, below the dotted line, each worldview only appreciates its own center of gravity. Above the dotted line, there's a compassionate sense of understanding and inclusion at the different levels below the dotted line. And that is where skilled leadership, resonant leadership comes in. We, you know, if, if that answers your question, Elsa, how do you meet people who honor a hero leader, who prefer to be told exactly what to do, how to do it, and, and who feel safe in that world? How do you honor that? And how do you honor people who are living at a sense of wanting consultation, wanting to have consensus, wanting to be part of a community? in a shared sense. A leader has to meet all those needs. Uh, Dr. Aiken, there's another one from, uh, from uh, Jeff. I think all of us exist in a system which is powerful. How does one break out of this system to advance this evolution? Oh, well, yes, my secret revolutionary message <laughs> is, yeah, how do we do that? Because that's that above the dotted line, the less than 2%. At the moment, it is estimated that there is no institution or community at large numbers that we can actually point to and say, there it is. But we do know that it is emergent, that that intelligence is emergent. 
that the pain of living with the world that we're in at the moment is very present and people um, have given voice to it. There's a very interesting um, two books that I know I've been sharing with a couple of people, certainly one of them's on the call, two of them are on the call today that, that I've seen. Um, and that's the manifesto by uh, the author Hansi Freinacht, the purported author Hansi Freinacht. Uh, and the first part of the manifesto is called The Listening Society. Um, this manifesto suggests that we have moved away from postmodernism and are emer not moved away, we're still in it, but what is emergent is metamodernism. And metamodernism is a consciousness, that, in my view, above the leap. And they describe very beautifully, I say they because Hansi Freinacht is in fact not just one author, he's two people, but the manifesto is written under that name. Um, the first part of the manifesto describes these stages of development in very interesting ways. Um, what metamodernism embraces and is hoping will emerge at scale is what we're talking about above the dotted line. And they give examples of where it is emergent, um, particularly in Nordic countries. And the second part of the manifesto is called the Nordic ideology, a set of six ideas, six proposals of how a metamodernist world can function, a metamodernist politics can function. So it's complex, it's interesting. And what is exciting is there's evidence for its emergence, but it's fragile. So so Perhaps a, an example, there's a question uh, of our, a, a real practical way. How, how do we recognize it um, from Matilda and perhaps from Audrey that relates to that? Where would you position Google? Is it emergent? So something uh, practical uh, that we can uh, notice? So I think um, something practical where we can notice consciousness above the line? Is that what's being asked? Uh, so the question is, so how is this understanding of the different levels that exist in an organization made real in a practical way? Ah, oh, oh, good. Okay, we're getting there. I think I have a slide for that. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's move on and, and, and we'll be looking at that. Take the next one. Okay. And, and the point about that whole picture that we're looking at, that we've just been looking at, is what the point that um, Frederick Leloux makes in his book, Reinventing Organizations, where he's actually gone and looked for the evidence of leaders operating above the dotted line, successfully operating above the dotted line. And there are a few. And he says, the spectrum of human consciousness is wider than at any time in history right now. So all those levels that we've been looking at in that graphic are currently with us. Whereas at a certain point in human history, there might have been one or two or three of those levels, certainly up to about the 13th or 14th century in Western civilization, we didn't have amber organizations, we have the hero leader, we have feudal lordships, we had a king. And it was a long time before we had a king and council or a parliament. So we are now living with the emergence of everything that we've seen in the graphic that I showed. And the same is true in organizations in the same city, if we care to look, Lulu says, we can find red, amber or blue, orange and green organizations working side by side. So if we just go back to that picture, let me see if I can do that. Yes, three, four, five, six, and possibly a touch of seven, all present right now, shoulder to shoulder in any society that we're in, and probably in any organization. 
And how can we recognize it? The question was, here's how Lelou says, you can organize it through looking at how compensation is decided in a company, in an organization. If a boss can freely on a whim decide to increase or reduce pay, that would be consistent with the impulsive red worldview or paradigm. If salaries are fixed and determined by a person's level in the hierarchy or a person's diploma, that sounds like conformist amber blue. A system that stresses individual incentives if people reach predetermined targets probably stems from achievement orange worldview. A focus on team bonuses would be in line with pluralistic green perspective. So there is a practical way in which you can recognize some of the dynamics in an organization. How are decisions made? Who makes the decisions? How are people involved? What are, uh, what are the hierarchies like? How does power operate? Any more questions, Jacques, shall we move on? Uh, perhaps just one, something that uh, from my side, uh, Dr. Aiken, if I look at those statements, none of them seem 100% correct or perhaps 100% wrong. Um, so I, it's like as if I recognize uh, that these levels or these stages, um, are they, are, is, is one better than the other? Is it, uh, do, I, uh, do I have to strive to, uh, to the, uh, one of the higher colors? What, what does, how does that work? Yeah, well, you're asking a question that that's where we're going is um, one is not necessarily better than the other if the worldview sits well with everybody who's in it. But if you've got a, um, a, a manager whose attitude is I'm the boss and you yourself have developed to a, um, an independent thinking, creative worldview, the orange worldview, imagine how it is to be managed by that, that boss. So, and, and, and that's exactly what happens in organizations is a person's level of development sometimes, or their fears in, in managing the roles and responsibilities of leadership, keep them at um, a, a acting out in a worldview uh, or the set of values and behaviors that are very, very difficult for somebody who's surpassed that worldview, that set of behaviors to be able to deal with. It feels very constraining. Yeah. There's a question from Christelle uh, asking, can a crisis or pandemic provide momentum to move society from one individual to community themes? Um, and that's, that's exactly where we're going, Christelle. Here's the big problem. Um, and I'll move to the next slide because I think that's exactly it. An organization, and you could even say this planet, cannot evolve beyond its leader's stage of development. Everything is in the hands of the leader. So you know, if you look at what's happening in America at the moment, or Hungary at the moment, or Brazil at the moment, we've got a, a, a quality of leadership that very much is saying, I'm the boss, and this is how it is. Yeah. And the only people who are going to survive in that are people who agree to be with me. Stand with me, otherwise I'll crush you. So. It really depends on the leadership that we nurture and the leadership that we vote for, the leadership that we fight for. There are two necessary conditions if you want to transform an organization or a community, and that's top leadership or the owners of the organization, including the board. The only make or break factors are the worldviews, worldviews held by the top leadership and by the owners or board of the organization. And we see that in government, we see that in business, we see that in communities. So if the leader isn't ready, we're now into the we of leadership. If the leader isn't ready, what can we do? We can work to create a healthy paradigm, a healthy version of the existing dominant paradigm. So whether it's red order, how does red order lead with more um, 
with, with this harshness, say, I'm the boss, what I say goes, but it's done with less cruelty, less exclusions. Yeah? Or at the level of orange, which we would say is dominant in, in San Francisco in, in IT organizations and Uber, for example, or um, Airbnb, those kinds of organizations. How do you create a healthy paradigm in an orange organization where profit at all costs is the dominant value. In Uber, for example, the CEO, the originating CEO was removed because of the conditions under which he led that organization. So you can move from an unhealthy orange to a healthy orange by encouraging people's innovation, rewarding people's contribution, and changing the dynamic from being cruel or restrictive on relational participation. And that's where the concept of horizontal development versus vertical development comes in. We can get better at a skill that we already have. We can get better at understanding a basic set of behaviors and, and it doesn't change the complexity or the range of what that behavior is able to cope with but it improves its operation. That's vertical development. So I might be a, 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 um, an apprentice electrician and with lots of practice and advice and mentorship, one day I become a master electrician. But how am I treating people in that journey? And what is my worldview? The worldview doesn't necessarily change in horizontal development. We need it. We need horizontal development all the way, but it doesn't necessarily influence anybody's worldview or grow that sense of consciousness towards above the dotted line. But what we can do is we can grow key competencies to improve management. That horizontal development, how can we do that? We can do it through training people for mindfulness, being more self-aware, more reflective. As they get more reflective and understand their own knee-jerk reactions, they begin to understand more about relating to others. And listening, we know the power of listening. And neuroscience has been able to show us evidentially that the quality of attention that we give to others influences their ability to think well. The way we are treated influences our very immune systems. We have so much evidence for that in the writings of um, Lisa Feldman Barrett, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, Gabor Mate. These are superb books if you haven't actually had access to them. And what I offer to do, I will give um, Christelle a list of readings that I'm drawing on and if anybody wants them perhaps we can make them available. There's, there's so much now that's interconnecting, so many sciences and bodies of knowledge that are making up the story that we're talking about this morning. And then at this point I did ask Jacques if we could have a poll on how people, how conscious people feel on managing their bad habits, their knee-jerk reactions. Can we okay, just I can, perhaps if I can just relaunch the poll for those that oh. have not um, participated in it. Um, for if you haven't answered it, uh, um, please do so. How conscious do you think you are of your own knee-jerk habits? And while people are doing that, um, Dr. Aiken, there's a, a comment or question from Rolene. Um, oops, uh, just moved one moment. Uh, she says, as each worldview encompasses both a shadow and a light side, could the first step be to develop with a certain worldview, thus develop towards the light and then move to the next level? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. So I think as one progresses in consciousness development, one is more aware of doing harm and doing good. I think it goes with the territory of more conscious awareness. 
but not necessarily so. Uh, you know, the distinction I made at the beginning between task awareness and consciousness development, task complexity and consciousness development. If you take ISIS as an example, and ISIS has you know, feudal leadership, it decapitates people, it, it's a warrior culture, it, it takes slaves, it um, pillages and, and, and rapes and all these good things. Yet it's got access to the highest level of task complexity available in its communications, in its organization at that level. So task complexity, I mean, Darth Vader is, is a great example. I mean, what a fascinating, interesting, intelligent being. But at the level of goodness, uh, not so sure. So the ability to have um, high consciousness awareness doesn't necessarily predispose you to goodness. But I, th I have a feeling that the tendency is to do that, to do so. Hmm. I'm not sure I, what other people think. Dr. Aiken, uh, Greta asks, what would your starting point be to collectively move your team to the next level where some of the team members are not yet ready? Should you first focus on these specific team members? So again, if you remember, the leadership is so important. And, and, um, for example, I'm working with a, um, a group of people in two different organizations at the moment. Both of them, both sets of people are leaders in these organizations. And the one in particular, the CEO has a very clear, clear idea of wanting to be above the dotted line. The task now is to bring his whole exco into an understanding of what that means and, and how they need to role model those values in managing their teams and in uh, embodying what they show up with every single day that they interact with people in that company. So it has started with the exco and the kind of things that we're doing is improving people's ability one-on-one -on -one to begin with, to listen, not to interrupt, to be able to be aware of their own mind chatter when they're listening to someone else and discipline that. We help people manage the way they meet because managing meetings is a, a, a tremendous practice in raising the emotional intelligence of groups. Firstly, it requires that people don't interrupt, that people take turns in participating and give each other equality of airtime. So you don't have a dominance of a strong voice and other people just sitting back and playing with their laptops. So there are very good practices that you can do, but it has to be with the agreement of the leadership saying, we want to do this and we agree to do these practices. We agree to master them before we feel ready to actually move into our teams and transform how we behave and treat one another in our teams. Any comments or thoughts about that? If there's any comments there, please uh, type it in the chat box. I just want to find out from Matilda van der Pfeiffer, has your question been answered or would you like to uh, ask Dr. Aiken uh, your question? Uh, there's a question from Ilza again. How do you see the construct of collective leadership, non-hierarchic, factoring into this conversation? So, yeah, this is a great aspiration to have non-hierarchical leadership. Um, and that's where the, the, the understanding of a natural hierarchy versus a dominator hierarchy comes in. In a natural hierarchy, there is a hierarchy, there is order. There are more complex systems. Your heart is a more complex system than any one of the cells operating on, your, on its own in your body. So we, we have to honor the complexity at different levels. 
the range of responsibility, the range of perspective taking that a person has in, a, in that natural hierarchy, which doesn't mean that somebody at a lesser range of complexity is treated badly or disrespected. And I think that that is a real condition um, that needs to change in our organizations everywhere across the world is how we treat people. Are, are poor people dispensable? Is it only in a COVID crisis that we value the street cleaners and, and people on the front line as carers? So, and will this revert straight after COVID-19 when the pressure and the panic is off? Will those people then be treated as expendable, the lowest paid with the least securities? So that's the challenge of a natural hierarchy, a leadership in natural hierarchy, is how do we honor people at every level for their contribution to a healthy organization, a healthy society, a healthy country? How do we train for that? How do we coach people in their awareness of that? And there is um, a sense of optimism in that every human being knows how they prefer to be treated. And if we can build on that as leaders and as, as, as something that is non-negotiable, having a flat structure does not mean that there are no boundaries, no conditions that hold this in place that have to be very firmly honored. Otherwise it falls apart. So in a natural hierarchy, there's still order. There's still some people with more responsibility, more capacity, more task complexity, and more consciousness complexity. Okay, I can perhaps, um, continuing with that line, uh, Deborah asks, how do we support and develop leaders to develop higher levels of consciousness as they move through the talent pipeline? Great, because you're leading us very beautifully to where we're going. So the reason I asked about um, people's habits, you know, how, how conscious are you of your habits? And 44% and say very aware, 53% say I'm sort of aware, and some say I'm not sure what you mean. Well, the, the problem with our habits, and neuroscience tells us, I'm going to take the poll off now, Okay. why we might be um, so subject to knee-jerk reactions. It's, it's pretty physiological and it's deeply keyed to our survival and a lot of our brain patterning, our, our instinctive patterning is around optimizing our survival. And I've, I've often sort of speculated with students, if you could ask a baby when it's born, what are you thinking? What's most on your mind? If that baby could tell you, it might tell you, all I want to know is how do I survive around here? What do I need to do to be looked after and loved to make this pleasant for me? So what a baby does, and, and, and incredibly intensely, as it gains more consciousness after birth, it watches, it observes. It's constantly, every minute that it, it is awake, it is learning and watching. And what it does when it's learning and watching is it puts together, it's, it's, it's putting together little patterns in its brain. It's creating patterns, algorithms, ways of quickly recognizing what works, what doesn't work. And those algorithms, if you like, become little apps, little, those app files are then zipped and put into the basal ganglia. And when a pattern out there is recognized, a trigger, out pops the algorithm. I know exactly what to do, I recognize the situation. So before we're even verbal, we've developed a lot of those patterns. And as we grow older, some of them serve us incredibly well. And some of them have outlived their usefulness. We need to learn new patterns or resist the temptation to behave according to an, a previous pattern. And, and, and that is the problem with our habits. So I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share with you two very short 
um, case studies of a woman, G. She's a very well liked executive leader in a, in a design company. Um, her complaint and why she came for coaching is she's forever exhausted and she's always lagging behind her deadlines and it's causing stress for her team and there are consequences. For M, he's a national CFO of an international retail company who's getting 360 degree feedback that quite a few people don't like him. And in each case, there are consequences looming. Yeah. And what G has had to recognize as a deep pattern that she didn't have words for, she had a compulsion, she has a compulsion to help. So if somebody says, can you help us with this, no matter what's on her table, she dives in. And, and her own deadlines, her own priorities start to get forgotten or start to get, she just can't cope with a heap of work that she's got. And her, it has been very difficult for her to recognize what it is that makes her jump in like that and take the awful consequences that she's now facing of being told by her superiors, you have to change how this happens. You have to meet your deadlines. They're not interested in what causes her knee-jerk habit. They just want to see the change. And what she's had to recognize at a very deep level is she is fearful of not helping people. It's not, it, it's not grown up, it's not very adult, that she has an inherent fear of if I don't help, I'll, I won't be loved, quite simply. I won't be welcome. I need to do this to know that I will still be accepted by other human beings. And of course, it's not reasonable. It's at a very young level. And once she began to realize that and bring that into front of mind, she was able to catch in the moment this urge to help and to say, let me know if you can't manage on your own, if you haven't found somebody else to help you, tell me at four o'clock this afternoon, make a change. She was able to draw that impulsive moment of I'll do it into the front of mind, pause, change change the behavior in the moment. It relapses, but she's much more in the practice now, and she's far better at managing her deadlines. For M, what he realized is they had a real problem with interrupting people, talking harshly to people, criticizing. He didn't allow people to be heard. And he felt he was a very good leader, very good manager, and he was quite hurt and surprised by some of the feedback until he realized that that's what he does. He doesn't listen. And his internal message around that was, I need to prove that I'm clever. I need to prove that my ideas work. I need to prove that I can do this. Once he took away that dread of being stupid and of being seen to be stupid, he learned to discipline himself, to learn to listen, to ask questions, to not interrupt. But it, it, it took a lot of doing, a lot of self-honesty and courage to move those patterns. So how can we start to do that for ourselves? And we're now moving into the we of, the, the me of leadership. What can I do? So we've just talked about that, those algorithms where we put our attention becomes our reality. That, that again, if you read those, those books by Bessel van der Kolk and Gabriel Mate, your body is your reality. Your body becomes what you believe. Change your beliefs, change your reality. As Amanda Blake says, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And it's hard to acknowledge that and understanding when we where, where we have to change our patterns. So, what can we do? The me of leadership practices to take us to the next level of conscious awareness. We have many, many lines of intelligence, mathematical, musical, aesthetic. We don't need them all. What we need 
to do well is to be able to consciously work with those intelligences that we could consciously bring into our awareness. And in my training, these were the six training with Integral Coaching Canada and in Wilbur's work. These are the six intelligences that all normal functioning adults can bring into their awareness. Normal functioning being not brain damaged. So we move from the low end through the medium to the high end in our capacity to raise our intelligence on these levels. The cognitive level, that basically addresses task complexity, your ability to understand task information, to gather more perspective, to gather more data, to think creatively into a future. This is about fact. Yeah. And we practice that. We practice getting good at that. Read more, listen to people, engage. The emotional line of intelligence in this model is purely about your ability to show care and concern. At the low end, and we all start there, it's egocentric. Egocentric care and concern. The world is about me. If I throw a temper tantrum in the supermarket because I want an ice cream now, that's what I want. And nobody can stop me screaming and wanting that. Unfortunately, some adults don't grow out of that. But most adults grow to the next level of sociocentric care and concern on our emotional line. We care about me and my tribe. The rest of you can go to hell, but me and my tribe, we matter. And we know across the world that that is dominant. I know it's dominant in me. So one of my practices has been to consciously try to move myself to the high end of care and concern, world-centric, which means how do I show care and concern for me, my tribe, and my enemy? And that is rare. We've seen it with Obama. We've seen it with Nelson Mandela. We've seen it with Angela Merkel. We've seen it with Jacinda Ardern. There are remarkable examples of world-centric care and concern, but it's very rare. And for myself, I know it has to be a conscious practice. It's difficult. The interpersonal line of care of, of, of intelligence is about diversity. At the low end, it's an inability to, to manage diversity, to accept difference, prefer to speak to people, live with people, eat with people who look like, talk like, sound like me. At the middle range, most of us operate very well there. We're quite interested in diversity, we accept it, but don't push it too far. At the top end of that interpersonal line of intelligence, how do we truly, with an open heart and open-hearted curiosity, embrace difference? Really sit down with curiosity and open-heartedness. That is a great leadership skill. Ah, physical intelligence, the wisdom people say, people like Suzanne Cook Grater and um, Ken Wilber, that the physical line is the opening to the other lines of intelligence. It's the magic to the other lines of intelligence. If you concentrate on growing your physical intelligence, you will automatically have a greater handle on the other lines. For this reason, at the low end of physical intelligence, you're not even really aware of your body. It's as though your body belonged like a, somebody else's suitcase that you're carrying around. And when you start to pay attention to your body, to my sleeping, how I eat, my physical wellness, keeping myself reasonably fit, most of us hover around there, around that middle line of physical intelligence. We're aware of our environment. We're aware of environments that we, prepare to, that we prefer to work in. Do we enjoy natural light? Are we bothered by neon light? So, so we have that kind of awareness. Physical awareness at the high end yeah, requires a deep focus on 
what keeps me fit, what keeps me alert. And it's a high degree of fitness. We often find that CEOs um, with enormous responsibility, people at a high level of management are physically fit. They get up early to go and train in order to be able to do their job well. Because they need that ability to focus on what's under their nose as well as keeping in their radar what is going on around them. Being able to pay attention simultaneously to a great deal of information, which is exhausting if you're not that physically fit. So you can see in a way how that range of physical fitness and awareness help grow a stamina for the other lines of intelligence. The moral line of intelligence, this one is really important. And I, I really think about this a lot because um, I worry that business and, and the way business schools promote um, skills of business, that, that morally we're operating at the low end of the spectrum. If I win, I'm good at it. And if you lose out, that's tough. Yeah. At the low end, it's also catch me if you can. If I can get away with it, why not? And unfortunately, we see that mentality more and more in business as quite all right. This is how it is. At the middle line of, of moral intelligence, it's an agreement that, you know, look, I'd like to break the rules, but if we all do that, where would we be? So I prefer to cooperate and to try to hold a standard that keeps us all on a, 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 a kind of safe line. Now, the high end of moral intelligence, I think, is very, very special. Um, Wilbur says it is the decision to do the greatest good for the greatest number, preserving value in the whole chain. And what he means by that is if you took a family of four, say a four-year-old, a 14-year-old teenager, your partner and yourself, and you were planning a holiday to do the greatest good for everybody in that chain. So the four-year-old must have fun, the 14-year-old too. You must have what you need and your partner must have what they need in that holiday. That's the high end of moral decision-making. So Ken Wilber was interviewed by a, um, a Buddhist journalist who said to him, um, given your readings, you know, what we've read about your work and what you say, you value all sentient life. And Wilber said, I certainly do. And the, the Buddhist journalist said to him, well, what do you do when you're confronted with a Hitler? Wilbur didn't hesitate. He said, you take him out. The journalist said, well, isn't that a little hypocritical if you value all sentient life? That is a life. And Wilbur said, under the moral imperative to do the greatest good, you take out what is stopping the greatest good for the greatest number for everything in that chain. So Hitler's Germany did the least good, the greatest good for the least number, and destroyed a lot of value. Apartheid did the greatest good for the least number and destroyed a lot of value in the chain. So for me, that moral imperative at the top of the line of moral intelligence is entirely aligned with the natural hierarchy. A natural hierarchy proposes to do the greatest good for the greatest number. That is, that's, its ax, that's its axiom. Spiritual intelligence at the lower end, it's pretty fundamental. If you don't believe what I believe, you're probably not even human. And we know that exists in the world. At the middle range, it's pretty well, I don't mind if you're Catholic and I'm Presbyterian or Jewish or Muslim, as long as you know, don't, don't pressurize me around your values. At the high end of spiritual intelligence, again, it aligns with that moral line. It is a deeply, profoundly lived, embodied sense of connectedness. And both the top end of the moral line and the spiritual line bring to mind, for me, what the physicist, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson said when he was asked, 
what is the most astounding fact? And he said, the most astounding fact is that the world, not only is the world consisting of atoms, we consist of atoms. We are made of the matter of the universe. We are connected. And, and I think that the high end of spiritual intelligence is an embodiment of connectedness with one another, with animal life, with our forests, our flowers, our environment, our planet. So practice, every one of us can choose one or two of those six lines of intelligence to pull into a discipline for us. For example, on my emotional line, I've told quite a few people this and, and I'm quite embarrassed that I don't always um, meet my own commitments is on the moral line of, on that emotional line of intelligence, I decided to try to practice a more world-centric attitude, being world, most, more world-centric in my emotional intelligence. I should practice kindness in my car. That I discovered about a year ago, in November, over a year ago, that I was behaving quite badly in my car. And apart from being embarrassed if any one of you saw me, I just felt I didn't want to be that person anymore. So my decision was kindness in my car. And what have I found over the last year or so that I've been practicing this? And I have to remind myself every day because it slips. I find that I get to my destination karma and I influence a person around me sometimes. If somebody does something, we both look at each other, both prepared to be really angry, and we smile, go ahead, there's another smile, oh, thank you. And there's a little shift between us that has raised our humanity, tiny, with people you don't even know. So that's my practice on that line. Um, on the moral line of intelligence, I didn't think I had much work to do until one of my teachers said to me, have you ever gone through a, um, a rural, a, a, a urban area where the speed limit is, say, 60 kilometers per hour? Did you keep to the speed limit? And I had to say, no, I didn't. So at the moral line of intelligence, to do the greatest good for the greatest number, wouldn't I want to just make sure that I'm not exceeding what was being asked for? Simple things like that that you can practice. Interpersonal line, where do you notice your voice of judgment around difference? Physical line, how conscious are you of your attention in your body, in your awareness, in your environment? So each one of us can choose. And I know over 15 months um, in our training, we had to show evidence of how we were practicing those six lines of intelligence. And over that long period of time, I became quite disciplined at things like meditation and, and doing that mindfulness practice, which I've let slip. If you don't keep up the practice, you don't keep up the good habits. So mindfulness, listening, being aware of these six intelligences, is, 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 this is the kind of template that I work with as a coach for myself and my own life and with what I bring to people that I'm talking to, that I'm working with, who want to improve their leadership and their own awareness of how to reach above that dotted line. And, and that's about... If I can, if I can just uh, yes, sure. on, the, on the previous slide um, with, the, with the different lines of intelligence, uh, when I think of uh, values, values for me lies on the moral line, but at the same time, values are highly emotional and uh, spiritual. Where would something like that fit in? In what context or how would you uh, use it there? Well, the... All the people who write about um, what these intelligences mean, they believe they're interconnected. 
that the, the, the problem is they don't rise evenly. That's what this slide is about, your psychograph. For example, you can be very highly developed on the cognitive line, sort of middling on the moral line and very low on your physical line. You would have to be aware in yourself, how do I shape up on these lines? Where do I think is my highest level? What's my, what's my challenge? What's the evidence for it? Because these lines don't develop evenly in the course of our lives as we mature. And, and we, can't, we can't talk about a person at a level of human consciousness development without also thinking about their individual lines of development. It's complex. And each line evolves through each of the possible levels at its own pace. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. Any other uh, questions at this point? Um, Classy asks that if you can just go one back one slide uh, to the lines of intelligence. Yeah, uh, yeah, and um, the, uh, Dr. Aiken, I think uh, this is one of the slides that in our prep last week we also uh, latched onto this one because it's it, this is a complex uh, environment where you have to know where you are and be very self-aware. Uh, of your behaviors in these because they are all interlinked they are all integrated with each other you can't just be on one and think you're not behaving on another yeah so the question is or is it a uh, question just awareness uh, uh, just just a mention on on uh, our, our complicated of group no complicated is not the right word complex um, this uh, space is of these intelligences it's, it's highly complex. Uh, so I think, you know, if you think about the cognitive line along sort of the dimensions of task complexity, the thing is every single human being, when they are born, a baby enters the world at the level, today enters the world at the level of task complexity available. They may not ever be able to operate at the highest level of task complexity, but they may not be the ones who invent the new most wonderful next thing for the world okay but they're living with access to the highest range of tax complexity that currently exists we're born into that but when we are born we are born at zero on emotional interpersonal physical moral and spiritual lines of development i mean you know so many people say children are born socialized they are born to be social they're born to connect um, and and that we kind of forget the safety of that the, the beauty of that as we encounter things that hurt us in life but every human being that is born has to discover this journey for themselves and what influences the ability to manage that journey adeptly is what are you surrounded with when you are born? How are you nurtured? How are you parented? What is your environment offering you? And these are the huge variables across our planet at the moment. We know that people who are born into poor environments struggle to be able to get out of the limits of those environments as adults regardless of the potential for them on the cognitive line and other lines of intelligence. So there are a huge amount of factors and variables in, and opportunities for us as human beings on this planet to be able to develop ourselves. But there is a huge responsibility for us, uh, any of us who are working with leadership, I think, to try to understand what would, call, what would bring us to operating or being conscious of practices above the dotted line, to understanding what it is to honor and work with a natural hierarchy rather than a dominator hierarchy. Dr. Aiken, we have a number of questions coming up on this slide. Oh, um, the first one I see is, 
please give an example of working on your own cognitive intelligence. Ah, well, um, constantly. I like I was reading the Listening Society and um, Bessel van der Kolk's book. These are things I don't know well. I'm constantly trying to stretch what I know what information is out there, how well people do things that I can't do or understand. So that's the cognitive line. I want to learn more. I want to understand more. I want to understand what more complexity means. I want to manage my computer better. I want to understand artificial intelligence. That's on the cognitive line. Uh, there's another one on, in terms of the model line. Uh, where we sit with the uh, situation of COVID-19 and the impact on the South African economy, on the world economy, um, and uh, all the unknowns about it. So on a model level, how do we deal with the unknown? Yes, I wish I could tell you. <laughs> it, I, again, what is the degree, it brings back to the emotional line as well, what is the degree of care and concern? that you have, that you know you can show and work with in COVID-19 with what is around you. On the moral line, you know, there are some very sad examples of the low end of the moral spectrum in managing COVID-19. And we're seeing some of that in, in rebellions in the States, for example. And again, you have to ask yourself, would a different leader make a different, uh, have a, had a completely different impact on the way some people chose to celebrate Memorial Weekend. Would, that, would the leadership have made that, that difference? I believe it does. And I believe we see that. We see the examples of that in, in places around the world. So I'm not sure whether that's answered your question. I've got lots of questions myself that are unanswered, which is why for me, it's just such a thrill to be able to share this conversation with you because um, it's, it's a constant challenge to me, everything that we've been talking about. Uh, Dr. Aiken, uh, Ilza asks, does creativity factor under the cognitive dimension? Does the, sorry? Creativity. Creativity. I'm sure it must influence it. But your know, creativity can come into so much. I'm, I'm not, I can't answer that definitively. I'm thinking of uh, uh, on the physical perhaps, uh, uh, using creativity to, uh, in, in different ways to um, improve your fitness, for instance. Sure, also dance. I mean, that's a creative medium and it's physical. Um, I'm sure a lot of intelligences overlap with aesthetic intelligence, artistic dance. Um, yeah. Yeah. Caroline asks, uh, I suppose as you develop upwards on each line, you can also regress on each line, depending on your adjustment to circumstances. Yes. And the, the, the wisdom is as far as I can understand, the readings that I've done is that once you grow to a certain understanding, a certain practiced embodied understanding on a line, you don't really lose it. You can, and, and, and that's why I drew attention when we were looking at Claire Graves' quote, the oscillating, spiraling, emergent. We oscillate, it spirals up and down because it's situational. Sometimes we behave badly, like me and my car. Sometimes I behave well, and other times I think, oh, I could have done that a bit better. So we spiral depending on what's going on around us, um, how irritable we feel, how much good sleep we had, who triggers us. And I suppose that comes back to that first of all, the earlier question about the regression, when it's under trauma or crisis situation, once you have developed to a certain level, you might uh, regress momentarily in a certain situation, but you know you've done wrong. You've know you've uh, showed anger where you shouldn't have, and you come back to where you were. It's that awareness. You're absolutely right. It's having that reflective awareness, and that's 
why mindfulness is such an important practice. And there's so much evidence now. And Dan Siegel's writing, Jeffrey Schwartz, um, there's a, a new book uh, that Jeffrey Schwartz has contributed to with a man called Art Kleiner. Um, I can't remember. I, I, oh, yes, The Wise Advocate, The Wise Advocate. And that's about leadership and aspiring to these levels. And the usefulness about this book for leaders is that there are questions at the end of every chapter. Practices. It's a great one. So mindfulness is, is definitely a practice worth acquiring. And, and what we know about changing habits is they don't change because you simply wish a change. Because you write down a positive statement in your diary, I am this or whatever. The, the key is practice. We are all capable of neuroplasticity right up to the day we die. So that's the exciting thing about change and the brain. We now know the conditions for change in the brain, for changing patterns at any time. Practice. Committing to continual, consistent practice. And that is the responsibility of the coach, especially coaching leaders who want to acquire coaching competencies themselves, is it, it really means helping on the job. And I so agree with Nick Petrie's observations um, in his work that leadership programs that take leaders away to a beautiful wine farm for a lovely weekend and, and, and have amazing moments of insight and deeply moving connections really don't do very much when the leader comes back to a thousand emails and everything entirely as it is has always been in the workplace and they go back to default. So to be able to work with someone and their team consistently on the job, evaluating consciously, mindfully, week to week, what am I aware of? What is changing? Where did I regress? What would I have preferred? How am I doing now? It's that kind of constant practice and, and attention and support that we need if we want to change our level of awareness and start to move our consciousness towards above that dotted line. Okay, can we have one or two more questions? Uh, I would just like to ask, uh, Matilda said she has a, a question perhaps too long to write. So Matilda, if you can just unmute yourself and then uh, have a chat with uh, Dr. Aiken. Thanks, hi, Darian. Hello, Matilda. I actually just want to go back a little bit to your, well, to a previous point, but link it to a previous slide as well. Some, I think it was Jacques who asked, you know, um, values, is it moral or emotional? How do they interact? Um, and I've been thinking about this, um, the example you had of your executive who, um, you know, is kind of in a way too caring. Um, and that resulted in her being less efficient in her job. How does one, I'm assuming that part of that also had to do with her values on a mor moral point of, you know, being caring towards those that she works with and feeling really responsible. So let's say that moral awareness and emotional awareness is, is quite high, that development. But she needs to balance that with, um, with the requirements of the job. So that's a really good, really good question. Here's the problem. Her team were failing to deliver on the deadlines that they were all responsible for, yeah? Because she wasn't able to lead them effectively to do it, to do the job they meant to do on time. So they were lagging, they were getting irritable with her, though they very much valued, i loved her personality, you still do, yeah? So really, it was a, need for her to satisfy a deep fear that she had inside. The more moral choice was to do the greatest good for the greatest number. And that is 
not to dive in and help, but to raise people's ability to help themselves more effectively, to do the job they're meant to do. That, she, that was her responsibility, was to help people get to a higher level of capacity, not constantly depend on her bailing them out. Thanks, Matilda. Anything else, Jack? Um, uh, Ronel says, how does Maslow's hierarchy influence the six intelligences? Ah, that's a brilliant question, yes. Because I, I, I think Maslow's hierarchy operates fully in each worldview. It, it, it is not about the top end of Maslow's hierarchy doesn't take you the t to the top end of the, um, that ladder of human consciousness development. So if you're a fully realized human being at, at the top of Maslow's hierarchy, you could be that at red worldview, at amber worldview, at orange, at green. You're consistent with your values and your worldview, your achievement and your sense of self-realization is consistent within that band of values. There's no worldview that is utterly bad or utterly good. They all have light and shadow. So Dr. Egan, what you're saying is we have a number of uh, Mezzo's hierarchies to go through in our lives. Uh, tribal yeah. one, egocentric <laughs> one, every time we have, a, to, we have to start almost at the bottom. Yes, each time we move to a higher level of understanding where we're taking on more complexity, more, it's more challenge. Now how do I do this well? Now what am I asking of myself? Now where do I feel fulfilled? All right. Um, I don't think there's any more, uh, Dr. Aiken, so you can continue. We have, um, we have another 20 minutes left, so uh, we still have a number of slides to go through. Well, we don't really. I more or less have come to the end of what I want to share with you. Um, and, and to say that you know, the, this is the biggest conundrum of our current time, that I, I absolutely go back to Claire Grave's statement that we are on the cusp of a major shift and the evidence is there for it. And it's emergent, the values that are needed to manage to be a leader in this world are already with us, but not at scale. So it's, it's a commitment to what we need to do as teachers, as coaches, as leaders, as parents, to try to bring about that world in everything we do. Um, the beauty of neuroscience at the moment is it's actually providing hard evidence for the fact that we thrive on better relationships. Our intelligence thrives, our immune systems thrive. We operate as an entity, as a living entity, effectively far better in the presence of positive energy than we do with negative, frightening, regressive type energy. So we have this physiological evidence Neuroscience has shown us so much of what wisdom traditions have believed for, for millennia that, that we need to honor and bring into, to make it a non-negotiable part of how we choose to live and of what we ask of other people. It takes a lot of courage sometimes to stand up to a bully or to stand up and name um, practices in an organization that, that do less than nourish people. It's very difficult sometimes to do that. And I would never ask people in an organization or a team to stand alone. Um, sometimes there's too much to lose. But to try to get support from others to, to be able to raise an issue that is making people feel depressed or less than valued. It's something that we all need to think about is in the work that we do in the lives that we live, how are we helping support the courage to move us all beyond above that dotted line 
into honoring a natural hierarchy and just rejecting the dominator hierarchies that we currently live with. And, and that really is all I have to share with you today. There isn't um, a, another single slide that I have to offer you, but I'm open to questions. Dr. Aiken, we have one. Um, there was a hand, I saw a hand going up. I just can't remember the name now. Uh, Bridget, Bridget Woods, if you can un unmute yourself and just ask your question. Thanks, Jacques. Um, I, I'd love some comment from, from Dorian, and I think I saw a similar question, is around where we sit right now in, in this kind of pause that the COVID has off offered us, afforded us, um, and the general kind of deep questioning, deep uncertainty that we sit with now, how might that, or how might we see that shifting us over that line, or waking us up into the into the sort of possibilities of metamodernism? So I'd love I'd love your beautiful brain to unpack a little bit of that. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> That's lovely that you are. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what you're asking. That is there any possibility that COVID nineteen will help precipitate? some of the conditions for moving us into a meta-modern set of values. Yeah, exactly. That's what we hope. I mean, you know, we're hearing it all the time. That is what's it's so exciting. More than with climate change, at a broader base than with climate change. And it's actually linking quite beautifully with some of the climate change um, initiatives. But COVID-19 seems to be raising the lack of humanity in our world in a more present way than the climate change issues have. And I'm hoping that uh, ordinary people will begin to say, hang on a minute, where's our voice? Where's our political power? Why are, do we have no say in the world that we want to live in and in the way we wish to be treated? How can we create the conditions for inclusivity that is better than what we have? I don't know the answer. I just so hope that this builds momentum and that we all contribute to the building of that momentum and whatever influence we can have. Um, Jackie, I see your hand. I just want to uh, go to another question in the chat box from uh, Madri. Uh, something similar, uh, Dr. Aiken, what opportunities and impetus do, we, do you now see uh, under the COVID-19 pause for us to coach leaders to fast track new ways? I, I think we have to have a voice. I think we have to, you know, one of the, the amazing things about South Africa, for example, is our sense of humor. Our sense of humor says it all. We notice everything that's wrong, but we make a joke about it. And I wish we would take ourselves more seriously and, and contribute more to civil society and, and in raising the issues that really concern us, in insisting that we want leaders and governance that matches the need that's out there. So what worries me about the world is that there's an enormous amount of intimidation from leaders, from governance uh, around the world, um, and an enormous sense of helplessness in the face of it. And I'm just wondering what it'll take for us to be able to shift that. And it's emergent. What the hope is, the hopefulness is, it is already there, but it's fragile. Uh, Jackie, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thanks. Um, hi, Doran. I was just picking up off the last few questions and what Bridget said. And I was just thinking about the parallel between the individual, the organization, and this kind of shift in society or culture. If you think about the individual wanting to change a pattern or a habit, you know, we've spoken about how that requires attention, practice, and awareness. Um, and it's repeated over a long period of time in order to change that pathway. And if I think about what we're currently going through right now, it almost begs the same question. You know, if we 
if you are hoping that, you know, society is going to change, well, won't it depend on the same things, you know? Um, that kind of the amount of time, the amount of tension, the amount of awareness and, and the collective of that shift in that pattern, if that makes sense. You know, if if this all kind of goes back to normal tomorrow, I suspect that everyone will go back to normal, go back to their old ways quickly, just like we do with our, you know, our own habits. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's reason if it's kind of resonating or making sense. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a it's a real conundrum. It's the real it's it's distressing that that's the likelihood. So the leverage for me is in um, places like this, in the business school, in access to business leaders, in bringing people who have influence together, who understand the issues in principle. And, and you know, maybe we can get enough momentum to create an awareness at a level that might make a difference. And that's all we can hope for. Thanks. Thanks, Darren.